Hello and welcome to the True Philosophy channel. My name is Dave. The idea of this channel is to look at the ideas of philosophy in a particular way that may not often be focused on in our modern society. This is what I call foundational philosophy or true philosophy. And this is simply a way of looking at the foundations of reasoning and fundamental philosophical principles to help address some important and key considerations for understanding overall. The reality is that we are affected by philosophy almost all the time, but we may not be aware of it, mostly because it is often seen in a casual form, so it is not often recognized. But philosophy actually is relevant to all reasoning function down at a certain level. Now I will be going into some ideas that may seem to be controversial, and so it may seem like we are going down the rabbit hole, so to speak. However, this is simply because of the philosophical nature of what we will be looking at. I will also on occasion be looking at things using definitions and precise wording which is actually needed to be able to clarify some of these philosophically important areas, so please be patient with this as well. As you may have noticed, as I go along I am also going to be displaying some key statements on screen for emphasis. We often learn in different ways and sometimes it is also good to see words visually. And since this style of foundational philosophy is often quite specific, having the words on screen may help when examining certain ideas. So regarding definitions, definitions have the basic function of clarifying the meaning of concepts that are being presented. In this way, at a basic level, they help us distinguish between one idea and another. Therefore, definitions will be referred to frequently to help clarify ideas. The following shows the two general definition types that I will be using. First one is definitional content from the Webster's Unabridged Dictionary, which I think is a very good reference. It's, I prefer that. There are other ones very good as well. And then also definitional content derived directly through foundational philosophy. And we will follow up on that exactly what that means as well. So philosophy, what exactly is philosophy in general anyway? Let's look at some definition entries for philosophy. So here's a few that are from Webster's Dictionary. A love or pursuit of wisdom. A search for the underlying causes or principles of reality. It's kind of an interesting one. Investigation and inquiry, a natural function of the mind. The primary aim of philosophy to unify completely all departments of rational thought. So this last one here is pretty ambitious to unify completely all departments of rational thought is one way of looking at how to approach philosophy, I guess. So the first description refers to wisdom as an essential component. So let's also look at some definition entries for wisdom as well. Accumulated information, philosophic or scientific learning, application of learning, ability to discern inner qualities and essential relationships, good sense or judgment. If we wanted to put these together, we could say that philosophy is a love or pursuit of the search for underlying causes and principles of reality through a natural function of the mind to unify completely all departments of rational thought with accumulated information, scientific learning, and ability to discern essential relationships with good sense or judgment. So now that's pretty wordy, but we're just kind of threading through what those meanings are as an example. So types of statements. Now let's compare some statements in order to try to see the distinctions between whether they are generally philosophical or if they would be considered generally non-philosophical. So the first one here, a car is a vehicle. This is not really typically seen as a philosophical statement. It's more of a statement of fact. So let's look at a couple more. What is the nature of an object? What is really understood when one says a car is a vehicle? So the second two statements may be considered more philosophical simply because they inquire into what the fundamental underlying nature, meaning, or implication of the thing or statement is. It's not just saying a car is a vehicle. It's saying what is really actually understood when we say a car is a vehicle. It has that kind of double reflection where we're asking what does it actually mean when something is being presented and sometimes things in philosophy have that kind of a sense of the questioning of the fundamentals of it. So philosophy is asking fundamental questions about what the underlying meaning or nature of things are. Simply put, 
to inquire about things or question things in a fundamental way is philosophy itself. We can take any subject and we can ask what is actually understood by invoking a concept or an idea. And we can ask how does that relate to other things that we are also looking at and compare those things. So now here is the meaning of philosophy as the foundational philosophy definition that I'll present. There is two here. There's a primary and a secondary. And the secondary is just in order to cover the bases because sometimes it's used casual form. So the primary philosophy definition is the practice of inquiry or any system of thought that attempts to question, explain, or establish ideas, About. knowledge, reality, or understanding at a fundamental level. This is what I would call the primary definition of philosophy. Also what I would consider a more casual secondary definition of philosophy would be the following. An ideology, perspective, or approach regarding the world, systems of thought, or pragmatic considerations. So for example, someone may say, their philosophy of life is to be nice to others and to work hard. This type of outlook may be also referred to as philosophy, so I thought I brought up this informal meaning since it can also be used in common dialogue. So there can be a very casual sense of philosophy in just a general practical way of looking at things. So true philosophy and foundational philosophy. As I previously mentioned on this channel, I will be referring to what I call true philosophy and foundational philosophy. These are interchangeable since they are basically the same thing, just from a slightly different perspective and emphasis. True philosophy is from the view of examining statements using word-accurate reasoning. Foundational philosophy is from the view of building fundamental understanding from the simple to the complex. The word-accurate approach is a method to try to get a clear understanding of core fundamental areas and concepts, including many philosophical ideas that have been thought about for a long time and throughout history. Essentially, word accurate reasoning means that each word in any given sentence is recognized as a directly relevant aspect and contribution to the state of the entire statement. This may seem obvious, but the accuracy of any given statement is directly dependent on the words that are in it. And as such, in order to be accurately evaluated, each word should be considered as potentially relevant. Another way of saying this is that in philosophy, it is relevant to evaluate each assertion from the beginning to the end of the statement, as it is an enclosed logical structure. Once the statement has been made, each word is in a fair state to be evaluated logically within that structure. So here is a formal definition of this principle. Word aggregate reasoning is the method of evaluating any given statement from the beginning to the end recognizing it as an enclosed logical structure, and as such, where each word is recognized as relevant to the accuracy and status of that structure. So again, it maybe seems a little bit obvious, but when a statement has been made, in order for us to understand what is the meaning of that statement, we would have to evaluate what is being presented and the, what is being presented as the words of the statement. Again, obvious, but it's important that we acknowledge that, you know, the words are what is being given to us. So many of the foundational ideals we will follow seem to have some parallels to positions attributed to the ancient philosopher Socrates himself. There are probably some very good reasons for this, which we will get into as we go along. So Socrates was a philosopher during the fifth century BC in Athens, which was the city-state at the time, and considered to be the golden age, that we, when we look back on it, there were so many new developments that were made at that time, including a lot of very influential thinking on architecture and science and medicine, arts like drama and poetry and writing. Um, you had Odysseus, which was by Homer, which is a very important early work of literature, including democracy itself was considered the seed of democracy. So maybe Socrates can help us in this current area. He had been very influential at that time because he would question things and question 
anybody who would be willing to listen about some of these things he was curious about in a very public way. And he actually went into a lot of ideas that even went to a point where being political and ended up kind of getting himself in some trouble there. But it seems like he was really looking for understanding about a lot of things we may take for granted. So let's look at a relevant statement attributed to Socrates in a passage from Euthyphro. Euthyphro says, you understood what I said very well, Socrates. And Socrates replies, that is because I am so desirous of your wisdom and I concentrate my mind on it so that no word of yours may fall to the ground. So this kind of no word may fall to the ground sensibility can be seen as directly relevant to the idea of evaluating the statements in a word accurate manner. Now just to emphasize the difference between this type of statement and an example of an alternate position, let's look at two different sentences. Number one, I concentrate my mind on it so that no word of yours may fall to the ground. Very similar to what Socrates was, was saying. The second statement, when evaluating an idea, it is okay to dismiss many of the words because I don't think they matter that much. So I don't focus too much on the words, just the feeling I have. So those are two very different approaches to evaluating a statement. The first one acknowledges that the words are important and that not to dismiss any of those during the evaluation. And the other one is kind of like, I'm not really so concerned with the words, more the feeling. So those are definitely two different spectrums from coming from, and they're very different approaches to reasoning. How many words does it seem Socrates is willing to summarily dismiss? Apparently none. Again, what this means is that each word inside of a particular statement is legitimate to evaluate for its relevance to or bearing on the meaning of what is being conveyed. This is simply because technically each word is part of the statement. Therefore, it is relevant to examine its logical status or effect on the total statement. Again, obvious, but because there may be attempts or some tendency for some to downgrade or view the specifics of statements as dismissible, possibly for evasive tactics, it is important for us at this point to recognize each word's contribution so our examination is not undermined. Without using word accurate reasoning, how language is applied to examine or study ideas can often become an obstacle to understanding the very things we are looking at. It is quite unlikely that we can get a clear understanding of core fundamentals without word accurate reasoning. Okay, so we acknowledge that it is fair to evaluate each word in a statement and that this is important when trying to determine the accuracy of any particular statement. Hopefully this can be helpful as we examine many different philosophical areas. So if we consider the basic objectives of philosophy, well, what should some of our objectives be when looking into the subject of philosophy? Well, strangely, some may see philosophical discussions as either being troublesome or even misguided. Historically, apparently Socrates' methods of discussion also seem to be considered by some of his contemporaries to be meddlesome. Apparently, the extent of his public questioning and discourse seemed to be a major factor in his subsequent trial and execution. I will go into this further as we go along, of course. However, it is not really unexpected that any fundamental questioning of common reasoning may be seen as meddlesome. Some may have become used to many common perspectives or reasonings that are ingrained in society that we pick up, and so may not be comfortable with some of those things being questioned or examined. Some may have become invested in commonly accepted perspectives for either their status, authority roles, self-esteem, or even reasons of control or financial security. However, the fundamental questioning of common reasoning is probably what Socrates was doing as well. It seemed that some became agitated with Socrates' questioning of things. However, I do want to keep this first video rather short to avoid going over too many concepts at once, as I will be trying to focus on simple fundamental ideas first and then slowly building from there. This is the point of foundational philosophy, to build understanding from the simple to the complex. Sometimes 
and it often seems like the more complex the idea that we're looking at, the higher level of reasoning that we're having. It's also not always the case that that's actually what's happening. When things are simple, they're actually very important. There's many important thinkers that understood that by understanding things at a very simple fundamental level, that actually is a form, a higher form of understanding rather than just having you know, broad concepts or large complex things, even though they may seem like they're more important simply because of their complexity. So thank you for watching and stay tuned as I will be doing many more updates. You can also subscribe to be notified of new videos. Thanks and bye for now.